Of course, I misperceived completely, misperceived completely what the environment was in an industrial research laboratory. For some reason, people had told me that it was pretty much like being in an academic center and, you know, sort of the same thing. And while it's true that the skills translate to some extent, it is actually a very different animal. Um, it's a different animal because you, uh, you have alignment, or should. You have common goals. You have incentives. And if there's one thing that you learn in a business environment, it is that incentives are powerful. And you drive behavior with incentives. Now, in a university setting, each university faculty member is, views themselves more or less as an artist in a garret. <clears throat> and they are pursuing their own research ideas, and chance favors the prepared mind, and uh, that's an important aspect. That freedom is an important aspect of, of what they do. Clark Kerr, the president of the University of California system, famously said that, uh, you know, a university is a collection of 2,000 entrepreneurs with a common grievance in parking. Um, and that's, that's right. I mean, it is famously like herding cats. It's very difficult to bring them together. You, you can't, it's very difficult to gain alignment. No one can agree on what the central issues are. Uh, they're, they're not supposed to. They are seekers of contradiction. This does not work well in a corporate environment. Because in an industry laboratory, you're actually trying to get something done. And at the end of the day, you really need to get drugs across the finish line. And they have to make a difference for people. And if you don't do that, why are you there? I mean, there's, there's no point. So it's a really very, very different environment. Um, and I've, I've talked about it in, in different ways uh, for various audiences. One of the interesting things that I found over the years in running large industrial laboratories was that um, it was so difficult to work with my academic colleagues. Uh, not because we didn't share the same interests we did, um, and they remain great friends, and I love academic life and academic medicine. But for an academician pursuing a research question, Academicians often focus on the outliers in any data set. So if you're an academician, particularly for a, you know, a junior faculty member building their career, they are extremely interested in, in aspects of a data set that are perplexing, inexplicable, provocative, and highly reproducible. I can say, speaking as a drug development professional, that the last thing in the world that I want to see is something that's perplexing, inexplicable, provocative, and highly reproducible. That is a nightmare for me. What I want is something that works exactly the way I thought it would every time. Because biology is really complicated. The human organism is incredibly complicated. And if I spend my life trying to pursue all these little observations, I'm never going to get anything done. So when I work with my academic colleagues and we'll look at a data set, I'm interested in the central tendency. They're interested in the outliers. And so we're misaligned right from the beginning. Our goals are totally divergent. Looking at the outliers, you discover unusual things. Careers can be made from this if you have good taste. I'm not interested in careers. I want to make drugs. It's a different totally different mindset. And there were many, I, I, myself included, who wondered whether it was possible to run a basic research laboratory that was actually goal-oriented. I mean, where you have objectives. You say, well, this, we're gonna, this year we're going to do the following things. This is what we're going to discover. What do you mean this is what you're going to discover? I mean, chance favors the prepared mind, doesn't it? You don't know what you're going to discover. You're going to go out and do stuff and you're going to make observations and then that. No, we're, we're actually, we are going to perform explicit tests of hypotheses which are directed at actually getting this mechanism validated, let's say, in a preclinical species, and creating a compound that meets pharmaceutical requirements that we can actually test in people. Right? That's what we want to do. And we're going to set goals, and we're going to measure ourselves against those goals. And if we make progress against those goals, then we do better.
right? And, and we'll be rewarded for it, however that is. You know, it, it's not financial remuneration. P people, particularly scientists, uh, are rewarded by the appreciation of their peers. You know, they, you get a gold star. You know, it's Napoleon pinning a medal on his lieutenant and saying it is with such baubles that men are led. You know, that, that's really the, the, it's being recognized that's so important. And if you can gain with your group a shared view of reality and become aligned with respect to the goals and agree on a set of metrics, then you can drive these programs forward. And if you're thoughtful about it, you should be able to make some progress. And that is easy for me to say now. It took a while for me to understand that in the environment of a pharmaceutical company. You know, what is it we're actually trying to do here? And, and part of it, of course, is going from an academic department, which has independent investigators, and each lab has 10 or 15 people in it, perhaps, and they're pursuing their research questions. And, and your job, really, as a department chair, is just to make sure that they're aware of resources that are available to assist in the process and to try and ask questions that will help people grow and work together. You go into a, a, an industry laboratory. Uh, the Merck Research Laboratory Rahway site was uh, probably 11 or 1,200 people uh, at that site at the time. Uh, and in fairly short order, I had responsibility for all of basic research and all of preclinical development. So that was about you know 10,000 people. That's a lot of people. And at the time, I was running research sites not only in Rahway and West Point, um, but in Montreal, in Chibray, in France, uh, in Madrid, in Turlings Park in England, in the facility in Japan. And so just going around to all of these sites, to nine international sites and raising the flag, you know, once a year it took some time. Uh, but the goal was still, you know, how do you get everybody aligned and how in particular do you get people to, to work across sites? So I would make the observation that humans are tribal by nature. And much of my career, certainly in the last 20 years, has been spent trying to defeat tribalism. Because left to their own devices, humans will close ranks against their brethren, always, on the narrowest of differences. How many times have I sat in my office and had an investigator come in from the laboratory and say to me, you know, those people over there, they don't know what the hell they're doing. articulating a point of view from his little or her little group that had closed ranks against the other people over there, perfectly good people, doing good work, important work, but because these people were pharmacologists, let's say, and these people were biochemists, synthetic chemists, no, they just, they couldn't align. The, the, the best experiments were always, these human experiments, were always to say to the person who came in complaining, great, Go over there and fix them. Reassign that person to that new area. Two weeks later, they would come back and say, you know, those people over there, they don't know what the hell they're doing. You could watch these, these, these experiments and, you know, tribal affiliation take place over very short time intervals with, without any sense of cognitive dissonance at all. It's quite amazing. So a lot of what has to be done to bring these things forward and be successful in a biopharmaceutical environment, leading a research organization, is to get people to actually share the same view of what the problem is, how it's to be addressed, and to have trust and respect for one another in pursuing those questions. It's never perfect. You always have complaints. But to the extent that you can do that, and provide a structure in which people can work, it's inspirational. A lot more work gets done. People see that more work gets done. It's exciting. You make progress. And for people in the biopharmaceutical industry, there's one thing that they want. They almost never get it. it happens so rarely. The one thing they want, they want to make a drug. 
Most people spend, most scientists spend their entire career in the pharmaceutical industry without ever being within shouting distance of a drug. Not even close. They work for 30 years in the industry on three or four or five mechanisms, none of which have any value. They work for a decade testing compounds, none of which prove to have any utility at all. Compounds that you lavish affection on, that you place on a pedestal of adoration, humiliate you by proving to be toxic in some animal species, and you're inevitably faced with the fact that, well, it's only toxic in this one species, not in the others, and you perform this sort of zoo experiment where you test 20 different species, and it's only toxic in the one. See, it's just toxic in rats. It's not toxic in dogs or mice, etc. So, are people more like rats? Are they more, aren't there some people who are kind of like rats? What am I going to do with that? And inevitably, you can't go forward unless you can prove that people aren't like rats, which you can just about never do. So most people spend their entire careers in the industry not even being close, but they want it so much because that's why they got into it. And if you can give them the opportunity to more often contribute to producing a successful drug, it's a powerful incentive, and everyone can get aligned behind that.